I'd like to talk to you tonight about a medical condition. One which I bet you did not think was as common as it actually is in the general population. Almost one every 12 US adults are diagnosed with this disorder, which is a psychiatric disorder. And I'm, of course, talking about alcohol dependence or alcoholism. If you were to simply Google alcohol dependence, this is what would appear. And I decided to show it to you as an illustration because I found it to be both detailed and telling. If you look at it, you could almost come up with a story. You can see an individual who probably has problems controlling the amount of alcohol that they consume and also the time of the day when they do so. More than 3 million individuals will be diagnosed with alcohol dependence this year in the United States alone. This disorder is costly not only to the individual and to their family, but also to our society. The United States spent $224 billion on alcohol related costs. And these vary from healthcare costs, related crime, and lost work productivity. Now, many of you may wonder, well, how does a clinician, a psychiatrist, even go about diagnosing this disorder? The existing diagnostic tools are actually all question-based. They're all questionnaires that are designed to assess the level of dependence an individual has on this drug. And Diagnosis is really only a small portion of the, of the big picture. What about earlier stages, such as um, prevention? And what about treatment options? And there are a lot of individuals, laboratories, and research institutions around the world that are really spending a lot of resources in better understanding complex human disorders particularly those as complex as substance abuse disorder, or um, where alcoholism or alcohol dependence is one of them. And a very promising venue uh, has been genetics. I'm one of these individuals. I'm a graduate student here at DBM, um, a PhD doctoral student, who is interested in using genetics as a tool in informing better our diagnostic and treatment options for several complex human disorders, um, in particular psychiatric disorders, and uh, those like alcohol dependence. So, much of the DNA that is in almost every single cell in our body uh, comes in two copies, and those two copies are almost identical. However, every once in a while, one every 1,000 or one every 1,200 base pairs or letters in your genome, there will be a mismatch. And here you see that that mismatch is represented by the letter C being replaced by the letter A. And these are referred to as single point mutations. But they are identified across any person, any individual has them. They are largely inconsequential with regard to health risk. However, every once in a while, we are able to identify a single point mutation that is, in fact, uh, associated with health risk. And so this is what the quest of scanning the entire genome has really led to, has led to identification of these single point mutations. Now, I'm showing you the all 23 chromosome pairs which consists of roughly 3.2 billion letters. And we can really scan the entire string of DNAs across thousands and thousands of individuals diagnosed with any disorder. And we can identify the single point mutations which are going to be associated with, uh, uh, with the disorder that we're interested in instead. If you took my genome and that of any one of you sitting in the room tonight, you'd find that there are about three million differences. Now, that may seem like a big number, but with regard to the entire size of the human genome, it's below 0.1%. So it's really a very small fraction. 
So, all right, well, all looks good. We had genetic methods, we had DNA sequences of thousands of individuals, so what's the big deal? Why haven't we cured this disease and many other diseases that are out there using genetics? The short answer is that we really don't know all the genes that are associated with many complex disorders, including alcohol dependence. And this problem, which has been recognized for a while in uh, the field of human genetics, is referred to as the missing heritability. And this is the genetic heritability. We know that we, for alcohol dependence, roughly 30 to 35 percent of the causes of this disorder are of genetic origin. However, we've only been able to identify a fraction of them. So really, the gap that we're yet to fill is what the missing heritability refers to. And this brings me to my study. We were interested in finding associations using what is commonly referred to in the field of human genetics as a hypothesis-free analysis. And this really was a, a fairly simple analysis, which consisted of looking at all 10 plus thousand individuals that we had in our database and looking for associations between their alcohol dependence diagnosis and any other biological and or environmental factors that we, we had information on. So, fair enough, we did the analysis and something really interesting showed up. We found that eye color was actually associated with alcohol dependence. So at first we said, well, all right, it's only correlation, as most of you know, correlation is not position. So we had to address quite a few biases, right? So one of those that is very complicated and very important in the case of substance abuse disorders is, well, socioeconomic factors. We have house, household income, we have the educational level. We also have the cultural differences that exist between all these individuals. So we're able to address all of them. We had this information on every individual. One thing that I would like to single out is the genetic ancestry. So we can use genes to really tell us more about the ancestry of, of uh, anyone, really. So that's what we did. We looked at around 1,300 individuals. In the three colors you see here, is, uh, they represent the three different um, regions of Europe where the great-grandparents of these individuals came, came from. The United States. So that's Northern, Central, and Southern European. And the uh, information that was used to make this, this, uh, this graph, this uh, 3D plot, was their genetic information. So we were able to cross-reference the self-reported information with their genetic information. We found that they, they uh, agreed fairly well. All right, so now that we have three different, we don't just simply have European Americans. We have European Americans, largely of northern or central or southern uh, European ancestry. We can then conduct the same association analysis and ask the question, well, now if we, are, we separate people into three groups, does that association between alcohol dependence and eye color still hold? And the answer is actually yes. So it did not matter if these individuals of European American descent were largely northern, central or southern European, Light eye color was, in fact, a risk factor for in, in any of those three uh, cases. So the next step really was to bring in a little bit of biology. This is all statistics, correlations. You know, a lot of people would probably uh, be put to sleep by now if they just hear about numbers. So what about biology? Well, so the next thing we did was to look at, uh, to do a more hypothesis-driven test. We built two sets of genes for each of the two phenotypes that the, the we're interested in, which is the eye color and the alcohol dependence diagnosis. And we asked the question, how many connections do we see between these two genes, or, or their products, meaning the proteins that these genes code for? Well, the answer turned out to be 130 connections. What does this number mean? Well, it actually means very little. 130 is just a number. But it becomes a lot more meaningful when you're able to compare this to what, what you would expect at random. So it turned out that the number of connections you'd expect at random between any two such sets of genes, it's really only about 100. So our number of connections of 130 
was able to tell us that we had some biological evidence now that the high color genes and the alcohol dependent genes were interacting at each other uh, with, uh, with one another at a higher rate really than expected at random. And the last thing we did, which was also a hypothesis driven analysis, was to look across the entire genome, all 3.2 billion positions, and see if we can identify a pair of genes where one was an eye color gene and the other would be an alcohol dependent gene, and they were close to each other. So could we identify such regions in the genome? And the answer was yes. We actually identified four such cases. I'm here showing you only one of those instances on chromosome 17, where to the left here you have the alcohol dependent gene, and to the right you have the eye color gene. And not only are they physically really close to each other, but the genetic variants in each of these genes happen to correlate really well with one another, as indicated by all those red, the red colors that indicate the genetic variants of these two genes are highly correlated, which means that they are likely sharing uh, some functional relationship as well. So we were able to combine hypothesis-free and hypothesis-driven analysis to support this, this uh, very intriguing and interesting hypothesis of eye color and alcohol dependence being associated with one another. So we were able to, to publish this last year, um, and uh, immediately after our first publication, we had comments from the scientific community that raised a few more questions regarding the study and its results, so then we had a response to that, where more um, the analysis which I've displayed to you tonight uh, are published. So, I hope that through the few slides I've shown you tonight, I've um, been able to convey to you the message that the only way that we are really going to be able to make any progress in that golden tree of the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, the only way we're really going to make medicine personalized in the United States and really across the world is by better understanding the biological underpinnings of many of these complex disorders. And I really think it is through the sharing of ideas and innovations, very much like we're doing tonight, that we are able to achieve that personalized medicine and really change the world for the better. Thank you.